Father, we are so very grateful for the way that you have made your face shine upon us, particularly through the remarkable gift of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, I do pray today that as we look at your word and as we consider where we are with you, Father, I pray that we will lift up our eyes to you and that we will respond to you. Father, I particularly today want to lift up the women of our church. Father, I pray that they would grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray your blessing on them and their household, and I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. It's good to see you this morning, and uh, if you did not, if you're a woman, rather, I should say, and you did not receive one of these, you need to make sure you get one on the way out, and Kim... I guess she's still at the welcome desk with my wife. Okay. Yes, Kim Reardon made these and put these all together. And so it's, that's amazing to me when someone takes time to do this. And so, yes, you can let, if Kim can hear, she can see you. Thank you, Kim. <laughs> she put all that together. Um, yes, this is Mother's Day, and uh, we're going to be addressing the women in the church. Now, men, don't check out, okay? Because... So many of the principles and things we're going to look at today will also apply to guys as well, okay? So with that in mind, I want us to stop and think for a moment as we have, this has been rather our theme for, uh, for quite some time, actually going back to Esther, and then uh, if you consider that. But our culture, as you know, is rapidly changing and is redefining so very, very many things. It's redefining what is good, what is not good, what is virtuous, what's not virtuous, what's beautiful, what's not beautiful, what is true, what's not true. And what this does is this creates a very huge and significant need for the people of God, for us to cling to truth, beauty, and goodness, and to show that to the world. To be a people of influence, because that's what we're expected to be. I mean, after all, that's what being salt and light is all about, is it not influencing and impacting the culture all around us for the glory of God. So giving this world that lives in darkness a shining light of beauty, a shining light of truth, that is my challenge to everyone here today, and specifically to the women of our church, even more specifically to mothers and grandmothers we do want to celebrate our mothers and grandmothers today, and I am aware that Mother's Day is a difficult day for some, for many reasons. But that said, we still want to celebrate our mothers and grandmothers, okay? And the lessons, again, that we're going to learn are applicable to all of us. So I pray that we would stay focused because I believe that this text has much to say to us. If you have your Bibles, or if you have a Bible app, you can turn to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. And just hang there just for a moment. And I want to give a little contextual background so that we know what we're looking at. This is the last letter that the Apostle Paul will write before he is executed. He is imprisoned in Rome in a hole in the ground. And he knows that he is likely to not get out this time. But soon he will die, and he will. He will be beheaded. The time is somewhere between A.D. 65 and A.D. 68. And Paul's writing to Timothy, and he's writing for a few reasons. One, he's asking Timothy that he might perhaps come to see him. He wants to see him one more time. But he's also writing to Timothy to give one more word of encouragement and exhortation because Paul wants Timothy to run his race well. Paul knows very well that his race is likely over, that he's approaching the finish line. But he also knows that he prays, rather, that Timothy has much more ahead. And so he wants Timothy to run well, to finish well. Now, Timothy had a very special relationship with Paul. Paul was Timothy's spiritual father, if we can use that term. Paul had discipled Timothy. He had trained him in ministry. Uh, Timothy was from a place called Lystra. It was a Roman colony in the province of Galatia. Timothy's mother was a Jew, and his father was a Gentile. And from what we understand and what we gather, his father never came to faith in Christ. So it's likely that Timothy's mother and grandmother were converted as a result of Paul's first missionary journey when he went to Lystra. And from the, that moment that they were converted... They began teaching young Timothy. 
They began giving him gospel. They began giving him truth. They passed on what they had learned. And that's how Timothy came to faith, through the witness of his mother and his grandmother, through their prayers and the lives they lived. The first thing before we even get into our text, moms, grandmoms, don't you ever stop praying for your husband, for your children. Don't stop. Be very intentional. Give them the gospel. Give them truth. Pray with them. Pray over them. Pray for them continually. The days ahead are going to be very challenging. But the word of God still stands and our God still reigns and he is still in the business of saving people. His word will always stand and your children need the truth. Your grandchildren need the truth. Intercede for them, pray for their salvation, pray for their sanctification. Don't grow weary. Walk with them through the scriptures. Pray for their spiritual courage, their maturation, and their protection. And being a young man who grew up in a Christian household, and somewhere around the age of 16 decided to start rebelling very hard against God, I will say this to you mothers as well. And I'm very thankful my mom did this. Don't you dare give up on that child that's rebelling. You keep praying. You keep praying. I'm so thankful I had a mom that stayed on her knees and did not give up on me. And I think that some of you have shared your stories. You have the same thing you're thankful for as well. So we go back to 2 Timothy. As Paul writes to Timothy, we're in chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Chapter 1, verses 3 through 5 of 2 Timothy, and Paul writes, I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. Paul has a deep affectionate love for young Timothy. It's like a father would love his son. As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your Sincere faith. And while you're there, if you underline, underline sincere. Because, ver because verse 5 is our key verse for our study today. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. It's very easy for us when we think about Paul and Timothy to want to attribute all of Timothy's growth to Paul. I mean, he's the apostle Paul. What better person besides Jesus to have as your, as your mentor? But the reality is the first and the greater influences on Timothy were his mother and his grandmother. And this is what Paul is ultimately going to point them back. He's going to point Timothy back to Lois and Eunice. These were godly women of influence. And this is going to be my challenge to all of you women today is to ask the Lord to help you to become that godly woman of influence to let God use you to show your children and the people around you something beautiful, and that's Jesus. I pray that Jesus would be seen in each of your lives, women. I pray that you would speak of Jesus. I pray that, I pray that you would speak the truth. Tell them about Jesus. Give this world Jesus. They need to see him in you. And if you don't have children, if some of you are saying, well, I don't have children, know this, woman of God, the Lord can and will use you to impact a generation of children or any age if you will just say, Lord, here I am, use me. Here I am, Lord, I'm yours. If you do that, watch out, he will use you. One of the godliest women of influence I ever met was a lady by the name of Mildred McWhorter. Now, most of you will never have heard her name. I believe she passed away in the early 2000s, I believe, or maybe it was late 90s. But Ms. McWhorter never got married, never had any children. But this woman had a great faith, and she gave her life to the Lord and said, Lord, whatever you want to do with me, I'm yours. I believe she was from North Carolina. The Lord sent her all the way to the worst part of Houston. And by the worst, I mean the worst. When she was young, and she planted herself there, worked with Texas Baptist Missions. And over the years, Miss McWhorter stayed. She endured death threats. She endured all kinds of incredible things over the years. But she poured her life 
out. And as a youth minister, I had the blessing when I was younger of being able to take youth groups to go spend time with Miss McWhorter in the worst part of Houston. And that woman walked with God. And man, I will tell you this, over the years, thousands of lives were changed. Thousands of children were saved. Thousands of families were transformed. I don't know how many thousands of people were fed. I don't know how many thousands were, were educated. I don't know how many thousands received the gospel, but that woman was used by God profoundly. So don't you dare buy into the lie. Well, if I don't have kids, God can't use me to him. No. Any man, any woman who says, here I am, Lord, I'm yours, send me, watch out. And there ends the real problem because most of us don't want to do that. We have our list of conditions, right? Here I am, Lord, send me to here, here, here. But not to there, there, there. No, you just give them, the, you just give them a blank check. So hopefully that will encourage you to know that no matter who you are or where you are, it's not about who you are as a person, but it's about who your God is. Lois and Eunice, their lives speak to us today. I want you to think with me. They lived in very pagan times. Christians were on the fringes, on the margins. Christianity had not yet taken over the empire. They were often, Christians, misunderstood. They were seen as strange, as odd. There were a lot of weird rumors going around because people didn't understand what Christians did, what they believed, and when they heard about the Lord's Supper, they thought that Christians practiced cannibalism, and so they had concerns about them. Because they didn't believe in the pagan gods, they thought they were also atheists. So this was a strange group of people to the pagan Romans. We live in neo-pagan times, and Christians are being pushed more and more towards the margins. And Lois and Eunice tell us today, it may be dark out there. There may be fewer Christians in the larger scheme of things. But remember this, our king reigns. He is faithful. And so you sow truth and goodness into your child, into your grandchildren, into the people around you. And he will use that and take it to do something amazing for his glory to make something special. So don't give up. Don't lose hope. You pray, you stay in the word, and you persevere. They testify that to us today. Even though there are not a lot of details about Lois and Eunice in the Bible, we know enough to know they lived their lives well for Christ. Turn over to chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, verses 14 and 15. And here's where we see, again, that they taught Timothy the Scriptures. They made sure that he was instructed in the Scriptures. But as for you, continue in what you have learned, in verse 14, and have firmly believed, knowing it from whom you have learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Paul is not referring to himself in verse 14 because the whom is plural. He's talking about Lois and Eunice. Timothy, remember your heritage. Remember your mom and your grandmom. That was beautiful. They, they poured into you. You stay on that path, all that they taught you. Now, Timothy's a big part of his heritage. But instead of pointing to himself, he points them back to Lois and back to Eunice and says, Timothy, remember what they did. Remember how they invested in you. They made a huge impact on Timothy. And so that's really the question for today. If I'm challenging you women to think through is how do you do that? How do you make an impact on children or grandchildren or the people around you? The key to that goes back to our first text in 2 Timothy 1 verse 5. And I told you to underline a word. Perhaps you want to underline two words. I am reminded of your sincere faith. Sincere faith, that's, that's the issue. A faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. A sincere faith is the focal point. If you're going to be that person of influence that the Lord will use to bless, you must have a sincere faith. Timothy had a sincere faith because his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice had a sincere faith. That's what the language of the text is telling us. So my prayer for you women is that your faith would be absolutely sincere. You might say, well, how do I know it is? Well, that word sincere in the Greek means not hypocritical, not an act. It's not 
I mean, it's not play acting. It's genuine. We actually get our word actor is derived from this word. So in other words, this kind of faith is not a show. It's the real deal. It's not just knowing facts about God or not just knowing facts about Jesus. It's genuinely being in relationship with him, being available to him, walking with him. Now some of you might say, well, okay, well, how do I check to see if my faith is sincere? I'm glad you thought that. Let's think about that. And men, this also goes for us too. First, a sincere faith means and requires an honest self-examination. It requires an honest examination. The same apostle Paul wrote this to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. He said to the congregation, examine yourselves. Examine yourselves to see whether or not you are in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? So many people lead unexamined lives. I grew up in church, and uh, I know Bible stories, and I, yeah, I'm a Christian. You know, this actually requires for us to take this. There's no more serious issue than where you stand with Christ, okay? Don't mistake knowing things about him with actually knowing him. Don't mistake being in the church building with actually having a relationship with him. Don't mistake being a nice, good, moral person with actually knowing him. No, the test is, have you repented of your sins? Have you come to the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross for your sins? Have you placed your faith and trust in him and him alone? Because our works do not save us. Have you received that free gift? gift of salvation? Have you said, Lord, have mercy and save me? And have you turned your back on your old way of living? And have you turned to Christ? And in the grace that he provides, are you taking up your cross and following him? That's evidence that you truly belong to him. Is your faith growing? Or is your faith stagnant? Because some of you say, well, yes, I am a Christian. I, I know that I've trusted Christ, and I'm confident of that. I belong to him. But for a lot of people, men and women, their testimony goes like this. I trusted Jesus. I grew. And then somewhere five years ago, 10 years ago, however long ago, the testimony stops. So, woman of God, I would ask you this as far as your sincere faith now. What's the Lord doing in your life now? How are you following him now? Is your faith growing now, or are you resting on yesterday's walk, last year's walk? You see, a sincere faith is one that comes to faith in Christ, but it's also one in which we grow. I'm not saying you won't have dry seasons. I'm not saying you won't have times in the desert. I'm not saying that you're not going to have ups and downs. I'm not going to say you're not going to have times where you wander and drift off, but what I am saying is if you belong to Christ then Christ is our life. He is to be your greatest love, more than your children, more than your husband, more than anything. So where do you stand with him? That's my first question. A sincere faith is going to require some examination to see where am I right now with Christ the great news is if you've come to faith, you can't lose your salvation because he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. He's not going to let you go. But at hand is this issue. What are you doing right now with the faith that you have? For some of us today, for some men or women, the first starting point to have that sincere faith is going to mean actually believing in the gospel, trusting in Christ today, receiving that gift. For others, it may be a time in which it's like, wow, you know what? I got lost somewhere along the way. I kind of drifted. Lord, I, I, I want to come back, and I want you to be my great treasure. That's the first thing. Second thing about a sincere faith. A sincere faith gives itself away to others. A sincere faith, if we want to look in the context of the family, would also include this, spending time with children grandchildren, helping them grow in their faith, meaning there's great intentionality because great uh, Christ is the great passion. Lois and Eunice clearly spent time with Timothy, and we're told that they instructed him in the scriptures. They showed Timothy, this is what's most important in life. This is truth, not what you see in the culture. It's all about Jesus. They evangelized him. They discipled him. They gave him their time. 
What have we been saying for so long, which is so very true? Where does discipleship begin, family? In the home. It starts there first. Lois and Eunice tell us absolutely it starts there first. They didn't drop Timothy off at church and say, hey, we, we came to faith. Could y'all make sure Timothy does too? It starts in the home. Moms and grandmothers, I want to encourage you this. What do you do with the time that you have with your kids? It's so very crucial. Don't miss that moment. Don't miss the season you're in. Don't miss the time that it's in. Yes, I know that parenting is rough. If you're a parent, you know it's not easy. It's continual on-the-job learning and training, is it not? And just when you think you get one area figured out, what happens? Oh, I think I'm getting the hang of this. Boom! A whole new phase. I did not see that coming. Lord, help me. We've been there. We've raised, by God's grace, two children, and I watched my wife invest in them. And I watched as we tried to learn. <laughs> Chris, I mean, he, that does not mean, son, it's, this is a participatory thing, so you can do it. Our family likes to joke with each other a lot, so I'm sorry. But um, I, I watched my wife invest and pour into our children. I watched her read Scripture. I did that with them. Our family devotional times were very significant. Now, were they always easy? No, sometimes this is not participation. Sometimes we had one absolutely focused, and sometimes the other one was jumping around, and we're trying to get them. And when you have the age difference, and then sometimes you go too high, and the younger one gets bored. Sometimes you go too low. The older one gets bored. Some of you know what I'm talking about. But you know what you don't do? You don't quit. And you don't, I've heard this so many times and it breaks my heart. Moms, don't rush the stage your child is in. Don't, I know sometimes we feel that way where it's like, oh, I can't wait until they start. Don't. Because each stage is precious, each stage is important. And if you kind of like, if you look at that stage and you miss it, you miss out on profound blessings because guess what? The Lord is at work in the life of that child at all these times. So you persevere and you pour into them and you don't keep that faith to yourself. You share. You share. And you walk with them and you cry out for grace because, man, it sure is hard sometimes, isn't it? Sometimes you just feel like men and women, husbands and wives, sometimes you just feel like, wow, this is just so hard, Lord. You read all the books. You went to all the Christian parenting conferences. You had it all down. And the people that, that, that were your peers, they, are, they had everything perfect. And they told you about it all the time. Remember that? Oh, we've got it all figured out. Just look at us. And you're coming home going, wow, man, I, this is, I do not. Something is wrong. Well, let me give you a little inside secret, parents. No family's perfect, okay? They're not. But I do recognize that for some people, when they hear things like this, they struggle and they think, I, I, I can't. I've already blown it so much. I've had a lot of these conversations over the years. Some people say, I mean, a parent just feels absolutely discouraged. and says, I, I've messed up so many times. I just don't see how. I just don't see how. Let me just tell you this. If you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, and we've, this has been something I've said for almost six years in this church because I think the Christians tend to forget this, and every Christian needs to know it. John wrote a letter to Christians. First John 1 John 1.9, he's talking to Christians. Christians. And he says, if we confess our sins, being to God, he, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when you blow it, not if, but when, you go to your God and you confess and you say, Lord, forgive me. And he forgives. Far too many by the lies of the enemy. And they say, yeah, I've, I've done that, and I just keep messing up. And every time I try, and then I, and then I mess up again. And then what it's like is this, and this is not the proper picture for a Mother's Day, but it's like a boxer who's been knocked down and is laying down on the ground, and the enemy's just whispering, stay down. <laughs> stay, you can't do it. Clearly, you need to stay there. Far too many men and women have bought into the lie that they've messed up and the Lord can't use them. God's grace is greater than all of our sin. 
woman of God, man of God, if you've blown it, you come to the king and you repent, you confess, and he is faithful and he forgives and he will pick you up and you run. And that may mean require, I don't mean run away from your family, I'm talking run into the battle. That may mean apologizing to people. And guess what? Sometimes you apologize to your kids. Sometimes the parents can be too proud. Say, well, I don't apologize to the kids. I'm the parent. No, they need to see that. That's gospel. When your children see that gospel humility and say, hey, you know what? I'm really sorry. I'm sorry for what happened. That's beautiful. That's amazing. So show them that. Give them that. So as Paul commends this authentic faith, we need to examine ourselves We also need to make sure that we actually do belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to give that faith away. And then as we look back at Lois and Eunice again, a faith that is genuine is not secret. It's on display. It's not just on display in the church building. Again, they lived and they were seen as as oddities in their age. And so they would have had to have lived their faith out loud for people to see. And guess what? Timothy would have seen that would have seen Lois and Eunice living differently than everybody else in their area because they were Christians. As Paul commends them for this sincere faith, you know that they live not only differently, and this would have impacted Timothy, and you think about this because you've heard it. Christianity is often caught just as much as it's taught. Your children watch you. and You say, I already know that, right? They watch you as they see Christ in you. That's amazing and beautiful. The Lord will use that. So don't give up. Fourth, a sincere faith. This is very important, moms and dads. Well, moms and dads, everybody. A sincere faith perseveres. If you really belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to persevere. Again, you're going to have ups and downs. You're going to have times where you stumble and fall. But if you are in Christ, the one who is at work in you will give you the grace to persevere in that faith. But often many professing Christians run hot and cold, up and down, start, stop, focused, unfocused, determined, giving up, back and forth, redecorating their lives every few months. Jesus calls us to follow him. And an authentic faith perseveres. It is a long obedience in the same direction. So what does that look like and how do we do this? How do we find, where do we find the grace to persevere? Well, first, it is grace. And that means you're going to come to him and you're going to ask for it daily. Lord, help me this day. Sometimes you're going to be praying it a million times throughout that day. Lord, give me grace for today. But an authentic faith continues. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 is my favorite go-to passage when it comes to exactly how you run that race. It challenges me, and I pray that this will be one that challenges you. But the author of Hebrews is writing to people who are considering walking away from the faith because of persecution. They're getting discouraged. They're getting scared. They're wavering. Paul says this, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, he's talking about all these saints that have come before us. Lois and Eunice would be a part of that cloud of witnesses for us today because they speak to us today. Their lives speak. He says, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with what? Endurance, the race that is set before us. And this is the key, looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Perseverance, one, draws from the examples of the heroes of the faith. We can learn from them. And you look at that that chapter 11, and you see this great list of heroes of the faith, and you're like, wow, that's amazing, that's amazing. They did this, this, this. But guess what? Each and every one of those heroes of the faith was imperfect because they We're sinful people who are redeemed. So we can look at them and we can learn from them, but we don't fixate on them. No, the only one we fixate on is the Lord Jesus Christ who perfectly ran that race. And we fix our eyes on him and we ask for the grace that is needed. We abide in him and you run. You run. 
You keep your eyes on him. Where you keep your eyes determines how you run the race. If your eyes are on your circumstances, you're going to wind up in a ditch. If your eyes are on other people, you're going to wind up in a ditch. No matter where your eyes are, apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, it's a prescription for disaster. So you fix your eyes on him. He will give you grace to run this race well. And my prayer for every single person here is that one day you will hear this when you stand before our king. Well done, my good and faithful servant. And I know you want to hear that as well. You focused on him. So what do you need to do today? How do you need to respond to the Lord today? Again, for some of you, men or women, as you examine where you stand, perhaps you realize, I don't think I have a relationship with Christ or I'm not certain. If you're watching us via live stream or if you are here today, I want you to have the opportunity to know how to follow Jesus and to know how to receive that gift and to know that you are in that relationship with him. If you have questions and you would like to uh, learn more about the gospel, learn more about connecting with our church, and you're watching uh, this by live stream, you can send us an email at info at stonebridgesa.com. Info at stonebridgesa.com. We'll be glad to reach out to you and set up a time to meet. If you are here today, we will have a counselor up here in the front. If you want to know more about how to to make sure you're following, how do I know that I'm following Jesus? Please come forward, or, or if you want to join with the church, just come forward and share with the counselor. I'd like to join the church. And we'll set up a time to talk about all those things. You got others today, perhaps during this time of invitation, this is a moment to say, Lord, I want you to be my great treasure, my great passion. Somewhere along the way, I, other things got in the way. He's a gracious and good God. However you need to respond to him today, let's all do so by saying yes to him. Heavenly Father, I praise you and I thank you for your word. And Father, I thank you for being a good and faithful God. Father, I I lift up everyone here today. And Father, I pray that we would be a people who give the world Jesus, that we show the world Jesus, that we live out a sincere faith. And Father, I pray right now, particularly for the women in our church, Lord, I pray your blessings on them. I pray your healing on them. I pray, Father, that you would capture their heart anew. And, Father, I pray that each and every one of them would just radiate the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ for all to see. Lord, as we have our invitation time, I pray that we'd respond to you now as we must. And I pray this in Jesus' name.